Well, today we're continuing a series that we started just a couple weeks ago. You can see it on the screen, the Genesis Chronicles, the story begins. And for those of you who are brand new, uh, this is actually the first of a three-part trilogy of series uh, based on just the opening three chapters of the Bible, uh, uh, Genesis 1 to 3. And if you've been here the last, uh, last couple weeks, you know that these, three, uh, these opening three chapters of Genesis are three of the most important chapters in all the Bible because they really lay the foundation for everything that's coming. It's much like, like an epic novel where a great author in the opening chapters will introduce the characters, uh, introduce the plot line, the place, the time, and set up the whole story that's not going to come to fruition, that whole plot line, the conflict, until the very last chapter uh, of the novel. In the same way, uh, the opening chapters of Genesis, are, uh, Genesis set in motion the story that's, that's going to kind of introduce all the key characters in action that's not going to get wrapped up until the last book of the Bible, uh, the book of Revelation. And so uh, if you've been here the last couple weeks, uh, what we've done is we've, we've met this incredible creator. Uh, Moses has introduced us this incredible creator who is brilliant, uh, he's powerful, he is creative, uh, he's personal. He is generous, he is beautiful, and he is absolutely good, who out of his incredible power speaks the universe into existence, the raw materials in the verse 1, and then over the next six days, whether you see those as six literal 24-hour days or six uh, eras of time, or whether you see it as uh, six days as part of a seven-day uh, literary format that was often used in ancient times to describe epic events, however you see it, that over these next six days, he carefully forms and then fills creation to prepare it for us. And so last week we, were, we had watched the, these first six days of creation, and it was all leading up to this high point, this crescendo. Uh, everything's been leading up to this, the creation of the human race. And so that's where we left off in verse 26. So there in your note sheet, you have a section called the high point, the human race. And what I'd like you to do is take your Bibles and open them up to Genesis 1.26. If you've got your uh, iPads or phones or whatever, open your apps, however you follow along. And uh, we're going to pick it up at, at verse 26. I'm going to see what happens on this, this sixth day. So, so God says uh, on the sixth day, he says, uh, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So note the plurals there. Uh, let us make God uh, 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 us make man in our image, and we'll come back to that next week, uh, but let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the livestock, and over the earth, and over the, the creatures that move along the ground. And so what we saw last week is that carefully crafted uh, work of, of uh, art, this opening chapter, and these, this, this, uh, this creation took place in six days. The first three days were forming days, where God forms our three major environments, the, the, uh, the oceans, the sky, and the land. And then over the next three days, he filled them in the order that he formed them with the, uh, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and the, uh, the animals on the land. But now we come to something different. Now we come to something unique. Now we come to something that's, that's different from the animals, it's different from vegetation, it's different from the trees or whatever, that, that God is going to do something completely different. He's going to create a being that is like him. And we're going to be talking about that today. And so uh, next Moses then inserts this verse of poetry. And this is very important. We'll come back to this. But, and and so, so catch this. Now in, in Hebrew poetry, they don't rhyme. All right, so you think, I'm going to think of poetry as rhyming, but in Hebrew poetry, they use, um, they use techniques like parallelism, where one line, you say it one way, and the next line says it the same way, and then builds on it, that kind of thing. They use repetition, and you see it here. As, uh, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Right, so you can see that it's kind of set off from the rest of the text. Poetry will come back later. Just a couple things to notice. So one thing I want you to notice is that both male and female make up the image of God, right? That we are created in the image of God, male and female. And so in a day and age where women were often seen as property or very low, uh, uh, most says no, God speaks says no, that uh, both men and women are created equally, fully in the image of God. And so then he comes back uh, in verse 28, and God's going to bless them. And remember, he said this last week, carefully crafted work of art, this opening chapter. 
we said there was going to be a lot of threes, a lot of sevens, a lot of tens, a number of completion, like uh, uh, perfection. And so remember, I don't know if you remember this, but last week we said there's three times where God is going to bless his creation. And they come at three critical moments in the creation process. The first time is when he creates the first living creatures in the ocean, and he blesses them. Second time here, he blesses the human race. Third time will come in a couple weeks when we get to, to the seventh day, he blesses the Sabbath. And so we talked about this that as a race that we are created to live under the blessing of God. And so, uh, so here God is going to bless us, and here comes a specific blessing. He says, God bless them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. This is one of the few commands of God that we have kept. Uh, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, we've done well with that, and then subdue it. Uh, and catch again a second time, rule. So we're to created a rule, we'll come back to it later, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living creature that moves along the ground. And so then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth. Now remember, uh, third day, God created uh, the vegetation, seed-bearing plants, fruit trees, and so on. And uh, remember what I've said all along, that everything that's happening in this creation is leading up to the creation of the human race. It's all a gift for us. And so you see an uh, example of that here. He said, I give it all to you. Uh, every tree that has fruit whose seed in it will be yours for food. That's why he created it. And it's not only for us. It's also for the animals. And so it says, unto the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air, all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has a breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And so now God's going to step back. And one thing we've seen at every point in the creation account, God steps back and he says, he looks at what he's done like a, like a master craftsman and he says, it is what? Good. good. Right. This is a good creation. We talked about it last week. Here for the seventh and final time. Again, seven, not six, not eight. Uh, purposeful, very pur purposeful. Uh, that on this, uh, He'll stand back this final time and he'll look at his creation in verse 31. And God said, he, uh, God saw all that he had made, and it was what? Very good. Okay. This is like, uh, we're all done now. It is very good. Uh, seven times, number of perfection. This is a perfect world, and uh, it's, it's very good. And, uh, and he says, there was an evening, and there was a morning, the sixth day, and, and thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their, fat, in their vast array. And so we've come to the end of the creative process. And so verse 1 starts, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it ends with, so it, uh, ends here, which is thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. And so, so now we've come to the end of the six-day creation. We're ready for the seventh day of blessing. We're going to save that for a couple weeks. Uh, but, but what I want to do today is I want to focus on this critical passage that we are created in the image of God, or in Latin we say imago Dei. It's a kind of very famous phrase. We're created in the, in the image of God, the imago Dei. And so what does that mean? Uh, how, uh, what is that? What are the implications for our life? What does that say about why we were created, the purpose of our race, uh, what, we're, what we're designed to do, where we find our meaning, significance, and fulfillment in life? It's a lot packed in there. So what we're going to do today is uh, I want to start by laying out a couple big picture, uh, uh, kind of epic type principles that flow out of Genesis 1 to 3 that speak to our lives, and then secondly come back and ask a couple specific questions that apply those principles, right? So there in your note sheet is a section called Kings and Queens, uh, the Imago Dei. Now here's the first principle. The first one that jumps out, kind of obvious as you read through this, is that we're created to be like God. You and I are created to be like God. Now, we've talked about this uh, last week and this week, that as you go through the Genesis account, it becomes very obvious that, that everything that is happening, uh, as God creates, he's creating it for somebody. This is like, in, uh, like, like you know, you, you watch in your, your neighborhood, and you, this, you know, say you live out in the middle of nowhere, and your neighbor's got uh, this, this huge spread, and you're watching, and all of a sudden you're seeing, bull, you know, you're seeing bulldozers come in, you're seeing land being cleared, and all of a sudden you're seeing building going up, and you're seeing uh, then a yard going in, and you're seeing furniture. Like, 
obviously this is being prepared for somebody, right? You kind of wonder, like, I wonder who's coming. Then, then comes that day where that limousine comes up and out comes the guy in the tux and, and, and the woman in the white dress. You know, like, what? This is their new home, right? Someone's been preparing this for them. And that's what was, what's happening. When you read through this creation account, you get the sense that this careful forming, this careful, it's leading us somewhere. And here we come today to the pinnacle. We come to the high point. We find out who is this world being created for? Who's getting out of the limousine? And who's getting out is this first couple, this first king and queen of creation designed to rule. And so Moses signals this high point in a couple different ways. First, the way he signals it is in the use of poetry. As you look at chapter 1, if you just read down through chapter 1, you notice it's all written as narrative, right? Like, you know the difference. Like, when you read Isaiah or Psalms, it's poetry, and it's written as poetry, right? It's, it's written in that way. When you look through Genesis 1, it's all just narrative, but when you get down to verse 27, it all changes. And right in the middle of this narrative, there is this uh, little brief line of Hebrew poetry. And so it says, so God, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Notice how it's set off in your text. The translators are telling you something is different going on here. Now, here's what's interesting. Remember I said these first three chapters of Genesis carefully crafted. This is going to happen in every chapter. There is going to be a narrative leading up to the bit, something big. And when you get to something big, it goes into poetry. It's like, it's, it's Moses' way of standing back and putting neon lights on this thing, putting a spotlight and saying, don't miss this. This is the most important thing. All right? And so, so here we come. All of creation leading up to this place where this couple gets out of the, the, the limo. They're created to be like God. Right? This, this is where we've been leading. Uh, but it's also used even in the language that Moses uses. A couple of weeks ago, if you were here, uh, and if you remember, which are two, we'll see. But uh, uh, we talked about a very important word in Hebrew. It was the word bara. And I remember, but does anyone remember what it means? Hey, good, one person, awesome. All right, so uh, yeah, to be created, yeah, to create, bara. And if you were here, what I said, very special word, it's used 50 times in the Old Testament, and it's never used to describe something a human being does. Bara is something God does. We form, we shape, we think up, we design, we mold, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we do lots of things, but we don't bara things. To bara, uh, as the New Testament says, is to create out of nothing. Only God baras. And so... Uh, remember I said carefully crafted passage of scripture, this opening chapter. Uh, there's only three blessings, there's seven days. Well, there's only three times where God baras. Three times. See, the first bara comes in Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God baras the heavens and the earth. Now, if you, if you actually know Hebrew, the, the verbal form changes. Like, it's not always, it doesn't sound, it's always bara something. But I'm not, I'm not going to go into that. I'm just going to say bara, all right, because you, you get it. So, in, Ge in Genesis 1-1... Uh, in the beginning, God barrages the heaven and the earth, and then at a critical point when he creates the first living beings, he barrages the first living beings. And then this is the third and final one, when he barrages us. But here's what I want you to catch, that not only is it there's only three times where he barrages, when he barrages us, he barrages three times. And so if you look at this work of poetry, the word barrage is used three times, again, signaling the significance so God created man in his own image, in the image of, so then in Hebrew, so God barad man in his own image, in his image of God, he barad him, male and female, he barad him, don't miss this, something big is happening, right? Don't, don't miss this, neon lights, something big, this is something different, this is something new, what's happening here, there's nothing like this in all of creation. This is not like the whales. It's not like the gorillas. It's not like the dolphins. It's not like the trees. Something new is happening. God is creating someone to rule, and this someone is like him. We are designed and created to be like God. Now, 
The question is, what is this famous phrase, imago Dei, what is that phrase, what's what referring, what do you mean to be like God? I mean, we're not omnipotent, we don't have all power, we're not omniscient, we don't know all things, we're not omnipresent, all places at all times. So what does it mean to be like God? And this is something that theologians, uh, scholars have argued and debated for thousands of years. And uh, 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 some will say, well, hey, what it means is that we, it's our intelligence that sets us apart from the lower animals. Others will say, no, it's our moral sense of right and wrong. Others will say, it's, no, it's our spirituality. We can commune with God. People will argue this out. But one thing everyone agrees on is that part of what it means to be creating the image of God is that we're created to be like God, catch this, in our core character. That, that we are created to, to our attitudes, our actions, our perspectives, our values, our reactions, our priorities, that we are to be like God. And, and so this is, one of, this is kind of one of the big picture stories that God is telling in the Bible. Remember what I said today in the, in the opening? That, that Genesis is like a foundation of an epic novel. The, 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 the characters, the plot line that's being introduced in Genesis 1 through 3 will be carried out throughout the whole Bible and won't be resolved until the final chapter. And, and today I'm going to give you two examples of that. One of the big picture stories the Bible is telling is that we were created to be like God that we became unlike God. And God has returned to planet Earth to restore us to be like Him again. And often as Christ followers, we know the different individual stories in the Bible. We don't know the big picture story of the Bible. Well, today we're going to be getting two big picture stories of the Bible. We were created to be like God. We became unlike God. And now, through Jesus Christ, God has come back, entered into creation to restore all things and to make us like God again. And so this is what happens when a person comes to Jesus. And we've talked about this the last couple weeks, but I want to go back and hit it quickly because I don't want you to miss this. This is the story of your life. It's the story of my life. We need to get this. In the New Testament, when, when, uh, when the New Testament authors describe the process of salvation and what God is doing in Christ, they often use the metaphor of new creation. And there's a reason for this. The old creation created good, created perfect. We were created to be like God. It all went bad. So now God is acting in Christ to restore all creation. And so, they, and so what, what's happening in Christ when Jesus came, there's a reason why Jesus is called in the New Testament the second Adam. There's a new, this creation went bad. We need to start over. We need a new Adam. Jesus comes to be the new Adam, the start of a new race, the start of the new creation. When Jesus dies, we talk about this at Easter every year. When he dies and comes out of the grave, he receives his new body, the first start of a new creation. And guess what? When a man or woman comes to Jesus and they're born again, we become part of that new creation. This is why in 2 Corinthians 5, the Apostle Paul says, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. If you back it up one chapter to 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, God who said, let light shine out of darkness. Referring to Genesis 1, 3, let there be light. He says, God who says, let, there be, let, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to show us the glory of God in the face of Christ. God has hovered over our life and said, let there be light. And we understand God is in Christ. A new creation is started. That we are born again. And so that's why in James, it says that we have been born again through the word of truth. That we might be the first fruits of a new creation. You see? This is a big picture story God's telling in the Bible. And so when you come to Jesus, you step into a recreation process. And I want to show you this. There in your note sheet, Colossians chapter 3, Paul uses this language. 
Paul says, do not lie to each other because you've taken off your old self. Uh, literally, in Greek, it says your old man. In other words, your old Adam. Uh, in Hebrew, Adam, Adam, man. You've taken off your old Adam. You're part of this new race. Uh, you've taken that off. You've put that off. And, you put, and you, well, along with its practices, the way of doing life as a member of Adam's family. You've taken off with this practice, and you put on the new self in the Greek, the new man. What? Jesus, the second Adam. You put on the new self, which, which catches, which is being what? Yeah, on your note sheet, circle that. Uh, ongoing process. And here's what I want you to catch. The God who says, let there be light in our life, we come to Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes into our life, and what happens? He begins to hover over our life, doesn't he? And he begins to renew us to be like God again. And you say, how do you know that? Because look what he says next, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its, what? Creator. Creator. You see, this is a big picture story. The New Testament, I mean, the Bible's telling. Created to be like God, became unlike God, how God has come in Christ to restore all things to make us like God again. That's what he's up to in your life. So catch this big picture. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? It means way more than just getting saved and going to heaven. We have What does it mean to be a Christian? It means you're saved and going to heaven. It is so much more. It is that, but it's so much more. The reason God broke into your life and let, said, let there be light, is to recreate you and make you a new person and to make you like God again. What we lost in Christ, he's come supernaturally through the work of his spirit to hover over your life and call forth beauty and order and meaning and design out of the darkness. That is what God is up to in your life. We'll come back to that. All right, number two. Second big picture story that we learned from Genesis is that we were created to rule. We're created to rule. And we, we saw this, right? We saw it more than once. Let's look at it again just to, to ground it in the text, 126. <coughs> so God said, let, let, let's make man in our image and our likeness, be like us, and, and let him rule or the fish of the seas and so on. Look at verse 28. God blessed him and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule. So, so catch this story that God's telling. Uh, amazing, brilliant, powerful, creative, personal, generous, beautiful, absolutely good God, out of his love, creates in six days, forms and fills, carefully crafts as a gift for us as our first home, creates us to be like him and to rule over this part of his universe for him. That's our story. Now, this amazing story, and it's unlike any story in human history. We'll come back to that in just a minute. But this concept of ruling for someone else was a very powerful concept of the ancient world. Like in the ancient world, you would have um, pharaohs. You would have kings over empires. Like for when this is written, you've got Babylon with a king over uh, Babylon. You've got uh, uh, pharaohs over Egypt, right? And so they would have these huge empires. And so they would appoint sub-rulers for their kingdom, right? Hey, you know... Uh, Rick, uh, you go and you take uh, this part, Mesopotamia, and you know what, and Janet, you're going to go there, and we're going to, so we're going to appoint rulers, sub-rulers, who are going to rule for the, the king, right? And on top of that, here's what the kings would do in those days, these, these emperors would do. They would make statues of themselves, like full-life statues, and they would place them throughout their realm, so that when you would see the image of the king... You might have, you're, you'll never meet the king, you'll never see the king, but you have, there's an image of the king reminding that there is a king, and that local ruler is ruling for that king. Are, are you following this? And so 
God creates this, this creation that is to be ruled by this race, and he says, you are my images, and you are going to rule for me, and when people see you, they're going to know what I'm like. You're going to be a reflection of me. You're going to rule for me. And, and that's what we're designed. You and I are designed to rule kingdoms, to reflect who he is in the way that we rule. Are, are you with me? Powerful. Now, th- we're going to come back to that in a minute, but here's what I want you to catch. This story, this account, this worldview of the human race is absolutely unique in human history. You ask the question, who are we and why are we here? There is nothing like Genesis in human history, ancient or modern. So let me give you an example. Uh, Why are we here? What's our purpose in life? Uh, In the ancient world, when Moses was writing this, there's a very famous uh, creation account. You know, of course, Israel has their creation account here, right, Moses? But, you know, Babylon's got theirs and the Canaanites have theirs and Egyptians have theirs. Let me give you an example. There's a very famous creation account called Anuma Elish that we have, we have today. It's from Babylon. And here is their account of creation and the creation of man. It, it starts off, there's this huge war between the gods. Two chief gods, Marduk, and a woman named Tiamat, female god named Tiamat. And they go to battle. There's this huge war. And Marduk defeats Tiamat. And when he defeats her, he kills her, and then he splits her body in two. And from her split body, half her body becomes the heavens, and half her body becomes the earth. A little different. <laughs> oh, yeah, Genesis, just like those creation myths. So the other, all the other, uh, have you read them? <laughs> a little different, you know, some similarities, but a little different. Right. Okay, and, and so then, after they got this heaven and the earth, there's a revolt eventually amongst the gods, because some of the lesser gods have to do all the manual labor. And they're mad at the big shot gods. And so they said, we need to create some, we're tired of working. We're tired of working, we need to get someone to do the work for us. They said, I got an idea, let's create some other beings. The human race is created to be slaves to the gods. Now can you see how different that view of our history is than the Genesis account? But let's switch to modern day. One of the most modern naturalistic worldviews or mythologies is the mythology of naturalism. We talked about this last week, that there is no God, that everything you see is just part of the universe, uh, and that everything we see, uh, this incredible, complex, uh, looks like design place, uh, is just a result of billions of years of quadzillion, or however big you want to go, of accidents over time. And so, so you're an accident, and I'm an accident. So what does that mean then? What's the story it's telling of our race? Well, it's telling us that, that if, you, if you kind of tease that out, if you're an accident and I'm an accident, if we are simply freaks of nature, what that means is there is no meaning in life. There is no purpose. For a purpose, there has to be someone who's purposing. There is no meaning. There is no purpose. There's no significance for your life or mine. And you say, that's depressing. (laughs) Yes, it is. Richard Dawkins is a very famous, one of the famous, we call them the new atheists, writing books, bestsellers. And he was once asked, because he's a naturalist, well, if the universe is all there is and we're just an accident, isn't that depressing? Here was his answer. It's there in your note sheet. He said, I don't feel depressed. It's a segment. I don't feel depressed about it. But if somebody does, that's their problem. (laughs) Maybe the logic is deeply pessimistic. Yes, it is. He said, the universe is bleak. It's cold and empty. But so what? When I was first working on this message back in June, and uh, I was doing some research for the message, so I was watching TV. (laughs) And uh, and this movie comes on, it's a Tom Cruise movie, right? 
I, I, I'd never seen this one. And I, I, I like Tom Cruise, at least in movies. Most of them, not all of them, but I like him. You know, so, so I'm kind of hooked in, and this, this movie is called Collateral. Now, some of you probably have seen that. I know you won't admit it. You're in church, but... Uh, <laughs> But anyway, so, so I, I started to watch this movie, and so this very kind of fascinating premise, this guy, Tom Cruise, the hitman, right? And uh, of course, of course. Anyway, so uh, he's a hitman. His name is Vincent, and he flies into L.A. one night, and uh, he comes into LAX, and his assignment that he's getting paid for is to assassinate five different people uh, over the course of one night. And so he gets picked up by this taxi cab driver. It's played by Jamie Foxx. And so... Uh, and so what happens is that Tom Cruise, his name is Max. So I'm just going to go by their real names because who's Max and who's Vincent, right? So, so, so Tom Cruise, uh, t- you know, tells him, you know, t- he gives him his fare for his first place. He takes him, and, you know, pretty soon Max is realizing people are dying, right? People are dying. There's a lot of collateral. Wherever they're going, people are dying. And he's trying to get out of this, but now he's forced against his will to continue driving. And so they're going through the night, and as, as Tom Cruise is going into these bars and clubs and shooting up people, and innocent people, bystanders, are getting killed. Even along the way, uh, uh, Vincent and Max, they, they flip the car because uh, of high-speed chase, and they're, they're about to die, but this nice policeman stops by, and he's got to help them out. And then, and then Jamie Foxx, I mean, uh, uh, Tom Cruise kills him, right, because he's a witness to this thing. And so as this movie's going on, the night's going on, uh, 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 Jamie Foxx is going crazy, and he's at one point, he's like, what is with you? Don't you even care? How can you just kill all these people that have never done anything to you? Collateral, don't you realize they have families, they have husbands, they have wives, they've got kids. Don't you care? And Tom Cruise, in those steely eyes, you know, he in the back seat, here's what he says there in your note sheet. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, don't, don't mess with me. It took me a lot of rewinds to get this. Like, <laughs> kind of messes up a movie, but sermon come first, I'm telling you. <laughs> but I want you to picture this. Tom Cruise in the back seat. Kill, he's a killer, right? And he, he's talking to Jamie Foxx, this man of compassion in the front seat. And he says, get with it. Get over it. Millions of galaxies of hundreds of millions of stars, a speck on one in a blink, that's us. Lost in space, the universe don't care about you, the cop, you, me, who notices. You see, if we are just ultimately one big accident, there is no such thing as right or wrong. There is no such thing as meaning and purpose and design in life. There is no such thing as significance. You are insignificant. You are an accident. The fact that you're here, you're a freak. I made a great sound bite. And you know what? As a culture... Though we have largely bought into naturalism, we have not understood the implications. We still fight for right and wrong. We still uh, fight for justice over injustice. We fight for things like tolerance. We say bigotry is wrong. We say love is what life is about. We sing songs about love as if there's meaning, as if there's significance, as if your life matters. But if naturalism isn't true, it's all a lie. And Tom Cruise has the guts in this film to call it out. (laughs) Men and women, we we live in a world today where we've got escalating suicide rates. We've got young students taking their lives because they don't see any purpose. They don't see any meaning. What's it matter? We've got... Soaring divorce rates. We live in a culture today where students are cutting themselves with razor blades just so they feel something. We've got places, we're a culture that instead of fighting drugs is legalizing drugs, right? Because the only way you can get through life is to be high. We've got a culture that's sexually confused. We don't even know who we are anymore. 
You go on a college campus, any college campus, on any given night, and all that campus, there's going to be hookups. A guy meets a girl. A hookup means there's no commitment. We just met. There's no relationship. Let's just have sex. That's all it is. It's just sex. And it's a way of life. We live in a culture with random acts of violence on the increase. And you, our culture says, why is this happening? I'll tell you why. It's because you raise two generations. You tell them there is no God. You tell them that all of life is an accident. You tell them that there is no meaning, there is no purpose, and there is no right or wrong, whether you put it in those words or not. They are smart enough to figure it out. And pretty soon, you raise a whole culture where the best you can do in life is find something to give me immediate pleasure or something to numb the pain because that's all that matters anymore. And against this picture of humanity, whether it's ancient or modern, comes the blazing pages of Genesis that has a different account of human beings that is unequal and it's unique in all of human history. It says, you are special. It says, you matter. You are created to be like God. There is a God. He loves you. He has created this incredible, complex creation. He is brilliant. He is personal. He is good. He is beautiful. He is kind. He is gracious. He communicates. He created you for relationship. You're designed for relationship, relationship with him, relationship with one another. You are created to live and to laugh and to be like him and to rule. And that's why you will never be satisfied until you are connected to that God. God doing what you were designed to do. Amen? Now, that raises a couple of practical questions for us then. There on your note sheet is a section, Kings and Queens, the New Creation. And so I want to get really practical here. And I say, well, so if that's true, if this is the big picture story of creation, we're created to be like God, we lost it, we're being recreated. If this is the big picture story that we are created to rule, we lost it, Christ has come back to restore the rule, um, then what does that mean for our lives today? And so, so I want to ask you two questions. First question is, uh, section Kings and Queens, a new creation, number one, are you changing? <coughs> I would ask you today, if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, are you changing? If you're not a follower of Jesus, so you need to come to Jesus, give your life to Jesus, ask him into your life so you can be recreated and start this process. But if you're here today, you are a follower of Jesus, are you changing? Because we've seen today that this is what coming to Jesus is all about. You're designed to be like God. And so when you come to Jesus, we enter into a recreation, new creation process. Remember what Paul said in Colossians, we're being renewed. This is something the Holy Spirit does. He hovers over our life. He calls forth the things. So are you changing? Let me ask it a different way. Um, are you a different person today than you were six months ago? A year ago? Five years ago? Are you becoming more like God? And your actions, your attitudes, your perspectives, your values, your choices, your priorities, your character, you know, or are you staying the same or are you even going backwards? There in your note sheet, I, re I put the verse from Paul again from Colossians 3. <laughs> he says, don't lie to each other since you have taken off your old self, remember your old man, and with its practices, you put on this new self which is being renewed, that's a work of the Holy Spirit, we're not in charge of this, he is. And, and we're being renewed in the knowledge of the image of the creator. So catch this. There's, there's something that God is doing. And this is real big. Don't miss this. God is in charge of this renewal process. When you come to Jesus, it's not like, okay, okay, you come to Jesus. You've been forgiven. Now you're on your own. Get with the program. Do some self-help. Become like God. Yeah, get with it. Knock it off. <laughs> Um, no, it's not like that. It's like the Holy Spirit comes and he begins to speak and lead and guide. He's the one in charge of your reconstruction process. Like he, he's, the, he's doing the remodel on your house, but there is a job for you to do, and that's to cooperate with him, right? And so what Paul says is that there's many times where the Holy Spirit comes and he begins to say, hey, this you need to take off, this you need to put on. 
Hey, this old way of practice needs to be taken off like clothes. We're going to take that off. We're going to put this new thing on. And so, so Paul says uh, that, that, that that's our part in this process, to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, like in this passage, he gives one example of lying. Now, why do we need to put off lying? Why do we take that off? Well, because, because the most important ingredient in any healthy relationship is trust. Lying destroys your trust with the other party, and lying destroys your trustworthiness as a person. And so, so lies tear apart the fabric of human relationships, and they tear apart our lives. And so, so Paul says, so, hey, if you're going to be renewed, you know, so, so you come to Jesus, right? You're used to lying all the time. You lie to your boss. You lie to your wife. You lie to your kids. It's a way of life, right? So it's what you do. You lie. You get a jam, you lie. And the Holy Spirit begins saying, hey, you're, you're, you're a follower of me now. If we're going to recreate the image of God in your life, if we're going to be like God here, if you're going to be designed, if you're going to carry out, then if that's going to happen, then you need to stop lying. And so I'll, I'll help you with that. I'll remind you, but you have to follow my lead here. Are, are you with me? And so, so... But here's the thing, if you look at Colossians 3 as a whole, before we get to verse 9, there's several other things he says we're to put off, several examples. Anger, rage, think 405, <laughs> uh, malice, um, sexual immorality, filthy language. These are all things that destroy the image of God in your life. You're created to be like God. When you do these things, they, they remove the image. It's like they, they destroy the image. You're not who you've been created to be. And then later in, in Colossians 3, he says there's certain things to put on in your life. And he gives these examples. Compassion. Kindness. Gentleness. Patience. Humility. And love. Okay, so, so are, you, are you with me? When you come to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in your life, he begins to hover over your life. That Out of that darkness, he's gonna call forth beautiful things. But we have to listen, and we have to follow. And when he says, hey, Mike, you're getting a big head here, I say, God, please forgive me. I, I, want, I want the freedom of humility. I want the freedom of humility. Would you just please, would you grace me? I need help there, right? So, so in your life, let me ask you this. With those who know you best, how would they rate you when it comes to change? Would they say you are open to change? They say, oh, they're, not, they're more than open, uh, hungry for change. Would they say you're committed to change? Would they say you're determined to change? Where would they rate you? Or on the other side of the scale, would they say you're resistant to change? You refuse to change. Right? Where, where are you? When the Holy Spirit comes hovering over your life in these character areas, are you changing? Because let me tell you something. If you're a follower of Jesus, let me put it this way. If you're not changing, you're not listening. Because this is why Jesus came into your life to recreate you in the image of God. And can I tell you something? You will never be happy until you change. Because fish were created for water. Eagles were created to fly. You were designed to be like God. And until you're like God, you are fighting your design nature. And this is why Jesus, so are you changing? Second question. Are you ruling well? We've seen today that we are designed to rule. And I want you to catch, of course, ever since the great rebellion that we'll get to in chapter three, we have rebelled against God and we've, we've tried to take the kingdom that we've been assigned and, and lead it for ourselves. all right? 
So go back to the analogy. There's a, there's a Pharaoh. He says, this is your kingdom over here. I want you to rule it for me. And what's happened as a race, ever since the Great Rebellion, we've been in revolt and say, I'm going to take the kingdom you gave me, but I'm going to use it for myself. Does this make sense? And so, so I want you to think of this. Every one of us in this room has a kingdom. And you think, well, I don't have a kingdom. No, you do. Your kingdom are those things in your life that you have authority or influence over. So it starts with our own lives, right? Like your, your mind, um, your body, your abilities, your natural abilities, your spiritual gifts, your financial resources. That's part of your kingdom that God has entrusted to you to rule for him. But then it expands out. If you're married, if you're a husband, Part of your kingdom is to lead your wife well. Your parents, you have part of your kingdom is your children. When you go into work, this is the, God, the job God has, has given to you. How you do that job, perform that job is your, part of your kingdom. If you're on the job, if you're a manager or a boss, you own a company, you are to rule that dominion for Jesus. To, to rule it as if he were. So, so you know what I'm saying? We are in the recreation business. We're going to take this fallen world, and wherever we go, we're to recreate it as much as we can, like it was designed to be, like Jesus would rule if he were there. And so the question is, how are you ruling? Are you ruling well for him? And this is so interesting because this, member is part of the big picture story of the Bible. Remember, I keep, I keep going that. That's why I love Genesis 1 to 3. It introduces all the themes that we're going we're to carry out through the Bible. And so here's the big picture. You were designed to rule. You usurped the rule. When Jesus comes back, he announces his kingdom. We come back under the rule. And now we rule with him now. And one day when he returns again, we will rule all of creation together. And so we are in a apprentice process right now. We are, we are learning right now how to rule our lives so that one day we can rule the universe. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, because Jesus said so. Uh, before he died, Jesus told one particular story several times in different ways. One of my favorite ways he tells it is in Luke 19. And he says, once upon a time, there was a nobleman. And he had to travel for a, to a distant land to receive a kingdom. Now, having talked about, we, we understand that now, right? There is a, there's a distant emperor, like in Rome, for example, in Jesus' day. A nobleman has been chosen to be king over a region. So he has to go to meet with the emperor to be anointed king, and he's going to come back and then be king over this region. So we, we understand that concept, right? Because we study that today. So while he's gone, he calls in some of his top, uh, top aides, and he says, I want to put my financial resources under your care while I'm gone. Um, and so in this particular version of the, the account, the story, uh, Jesus gives each, each of them a large sum of money. It's called the mina. He gives each of them one mina. All, in this version, they all get the same. And so then he, he goes, the king goes away. And of course, this is all a picture of Jesus, right? This is before he leaves. This is a picture of Jesus is going away to receive a kingdom. He's going to go through the cross. And he's going to ascend into heaven. He's going to sit at the right hand of God. He's going to be crowned king over the creation. <laughs> um, he's going to see this, this, this kingdom. And then he's going to come back. And in the meantime, we are ruling his things for him. And then we will be rewarded or whatever for how we've done. And so when he comes back, this first servant had done a great job. He had taken this one mina and he had multiplied it by ten times. Okay? Like a thousand percent increase. And so the king, new king comes back and says, well, I've got this new kingdom now. I need people to rule it for me. And you've shown yourself very faithful in handling this. And so now, instead of, I'm going to put you over ten cities. Now catch this. What's this all about? It's about rule. We were designed to rule. Jesus is watching how we rule our lives here now, when he comes back, that will determine what we rule then. And so there in your note sheet, this is what Jesus says. He says, well done, my good, good servant, his master replied, because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. This is a picture of the coming age, of what, what will happen. 
And so the question is, I have for you today, is how are you ruling your kingdom? Let's start with your own life. God has given you a, a mind, unlike the animals. Compared to them, we're all brilliant. When you're feeling bad, think of it that way. <laughs> Just look at your cat and say, I'm so much smarter. <laughs> no. um, but what are you doing with that mind that God has given you? What are you filling your mind with? How are you developing your mind for his kingdom? Uh, time. God's given us time. We all have the same amount. How are you investing your time in things that matter, things that don't? Um, how about your physical body? You've been given this incredible gift of a complex creation we call our bodies. Are you taking care of your body so that your body becomes a vehicle you can take care of the kingdom? You know? Whether what we eat or how we exercise or sleep, whatever the thing, are you taking care of your kingdom, your body? If you're single, are you remaining sexually pure with your body that God's entrusted to you? Your body was given to glorify God. Glorify God with your body. Um, let's, let's expand. How about your financial resources? Do you realize that everything you've been given belongs to him? In, in Psalm says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything you have is on loan to you. How are you managing your resources? How you make it? How you spend it? How you give it? And how you save it? Are you managing well? Straight, put, let's, let's expand it out. You're married. Husbands, are you leading your life well? You are called to lead as a king, to rule that relationship, to lead your life well. Right? Are you leading her well? In 1 Peter, it says, Husbands, do not be harsh with your wives, but be understanding with them, understanding that they are co-heirs with us of the kingdom. Are you... Are you loving your life well? As parents, are you parenting your children well? You know, in Timothy, it says, when you choose elders, make sure that they catch this language, rule their families well. Because if someone doesn't rule their family well, how can they rule God's, uh, God's church? Uh, how about on the job? The way you approach your job, the way you manage your job, the way you go to work, the level of work ethic that you have, the level of integrity and ingenuity and creativity and commitment. I don't care if you're a barista at Starbucks, you're vice president of a huge bank. Are, are, you, are you ruling well? If you have employees or you lead a team, are you, are you creating a great environment for that team so they can thrive? Why? Because we were created to live under the blessing. As a creator, co-creator now with Jesus, we should be creating blessing where we go. You see what I'm saying? Are you ruling well? Catch this. Remember what I said? The story that starts in Genesis lays a foundation for this epic account that's going to go all the way to Revelation. Here's a great example. We saw today the story begins that we were created to rule. Well, I want you to see on your note sheet how the story ends. Last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, where John in his vision says, I saw the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, talking about the new Jerusalem. And they, talking about the Christ followers, they will see his face, will see him, and they will reign with him forever and ever. We were created to rule. We lost the rule. Jesus restores the rule. We will rule with him forever. How you rule now determines what you will rule then. Are you ruling well? Let's pray. Lord, what an amazing passage of Scripture that just moves me. It is so incredibly profound, created to be like you, created to rule. This amazing God who's created us to live under the blessing. We love you, and we, we want to rule with you. And God, we, we realize that part of that rule is to reflect you to the world around you, that we'd be images of what you're like so that all the world could see and that creation could come back to you. And so, Lord, as we bring you our offerings today, 
we, we pray that you'd use them to do that, to tear down these walls between creation and creator, and that we would be part of a mighty movement that would see many come back to you, all creation come back. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said,